Uh, bum, bum, bum. Greetings all, last Outrider here with story time! Yes, during this COVID-19 season, I have decided to spend my time reading you stories. This time, I'm going to start with War Without End, a short story called Lord of the Red Sands by Aaron Dimsky Bowden. And we'll get into it right now. There is only one thing worth fighting for. He knows this. While his father languishes in the ignorance of false righteousness, while his brothers play gods to a godless universe, while heartless weaklings claim to be his sons, walking the coward's path over the way of the warrior. But he knows, even if no one else will listen or understand, that there is the only one thing worth fighting for. He crests the barricade, the axes howling in his hands. The dead city sends its finest against him, time and time again. And time and time again, the dead city's finest fall back in screaming, hewed chunks of flesh and ceramite. Somewhere his brother's colors the royal purple of preening fulgrim, or the drab pale hubes of the cadaverous motorion. They charge, dreaming of glory, and they die, knowing nothing but pain and shame. Some of them wear the filthy white of his own sons. They die no differently from the others. They bleed the same blood. They cry the same oaths. They stink just the same when their bodies are ripped open, organs bared to the cold air. Flashes of insight come to him in the storm of the swords. A name etched upon white armor seems familiar for the span of a heartbeat. The angle of an axe reminds him of another fight. Back in the age when the burning sun beating down upon the red sand. He kills every warrior that rises before him and chases those wise enough to recheat. The former he breaks open with single blows from his straining axes. The latter, he hunts in leaping pounces, the way arena beasts once hunted starved men and women. Glory? Glory is for those too weak to find inner strength, leaving them hollow parasites feeding on the affection of even lesser men. Glory is for cowards, too afraid to let their names die. He stands upon their bodies now, grinding boot prints into their breastplates as he adds to their number. A monument to the futility rises at his feet, each death means that he has to climb higher to welcome fresh meat. The hammer blows of gunfire keep on pounding into his back and shoulders with bestial kicks and irritation. Nothing more. Scarcely even a distraction. This battle was won the moment he set foot in the dead city. He buries an axe in the chest of another son, but feels it slip from his blood slick fingers as the warrior tumbles back. 
The binding chain at his wrist pulls taunt, preventing the weapon's theft, but he sees what they are trying to do. Three of his own sons shouting, scrabbling to cling to the axe they stole, even as the blade is buried in one of their bodies. A warrior's ultimate sacrifice, trading his life for the chance to disarm an enemy. Their united strength drags at his arm, turning his panting breath into a wet snarl. He does not pull back and resist. He launches into them, shattering their armor with foot, with fist, with his dark metal teeth. Their cunning sacrifice avails them nothing but death by bludgeoning rather than the shrieking blade of a chain axe. Their bodies are added to the corpse monument. Every movement is pain now. Every breath comes from ragged lungs through bleeding lips. There is still time. Still time. Still time. He can win this war without his brother's guns. Conquest? What tyrant first dreamed of conquest and clad violent oppression in terms of virtue? Why does the imposition of one's will over another draw men like no other sin? For more than 200 years, the emperor has demanded that the galaxy align itself to his principles at the cost of 10,000 cultures that lived free and without the need for tyranny. Now, Horus demands that the stellar nations of this broken empire dance to his tune instead. Billions die for conquest to achieve the pride of those two vain creatures cast in the shapes of men. There is no virtue in fighting for conquest. Nothing is more worthless and hollow than obliterating freedom for the sake of more land, more coin, more voices singing your name in holy hymn. Conquest is meaningless as glory. Worse, it is evil in its selfishness. Both are triumphs only a fool's crusade. No, not glory, not conquest. He follows the blood of his prey. The warrior slouches on the ground with his back to the wall. His armored thighs decorated with a sloppy trail of innards. Blood marks his face. Blood marks everything on this world. But the centurion's face is a reflection of the battle itself. Half his features no longer exist beyond bare, cracked bone, ripped away by the Primarch's axe. The officer's remaining eye is narrowed by the preternatural focus necessary to remain alive without screaming when your intestines have been torn from your body. He should not be alive, and yet here he is, lifting a bolter. Angron smiles at the man's beautiful defiance and slaps the gun aside with the flat of his still rearing axe. No, he says, savagely kind. 
This warrior and his doomed brethren fought well. And their father is careful not to offer no humiliation in these last moments. His other sons, those loyal to him, are chanting his name, shouting it through the ruins. They chant the name of his slave that his slave handlers gave to him when he was Lord of the Red Sands. Angron, Angron, Angron. He does not know what name the emperor had intended for him. He never cared enough to ask. And now the chance to do so is denied to him forever. Lord, the dying centurion speaks. Angron crouches by his son, ignoring the nosebleed trickling down his lips as the butcher's nails tick, tick, tick in the back of his brain. I am here, Karagar. The world eaters draw in a shivery breath, surely one of his last. His remaining eye seeks his Primarch's face. That wound at your throat, Karagar's words come with a bloody bubbling at his lips. That was me. Angran touches his own neck. His fingers come away net, wet, and he smiles for the first time in weeks. You fought well. The Primarch's low tones are almost tectonic. All of you did. Not well enough. The centurion bears blood-darkened teeth and a rictus grin. Tell me why, father. Why stand with the arch traitor? <sighs> Angron's smile fades, wiped clean by his son's ignorance. None of them have ever understood. They were always so convinced that he should have been honored by being given a legion. When the life he chose was stolen from him the day the Imperium tore him away from his true brothers and sisters. I do not stand with Horus, Angron breathes the confession. I stand against the Emperor. Do you understand, Karagar? I am free now, free. Can you not understand that? Why have you all spent these last decades telling me I should feel honored to live as a slave when I was so close to dying free? Kaurgar stares past his Primarch up at the lightning sky. Blood runs from the warrior's open mouth. Karagar. Karagar? The centurion exhales, a slow, tired sigh. His chest does not rise again. And Gran closes his dead son's remaining eye, and rises to his feet. Chains rattle against his armor as he takes up his axes from the ground once more. Angran, Angran, Angran. His name, a slave's name. He walks through the ruins, enduring the cheers of his blood-stained followers. Warriors concerned with glory and conquest, who 
who were born better than the aliens and traitors they slay. Fighting their own kind is practically the first fair fight they have ever endured, and their gene sire's lip curls at the thought. Before he was shackled by the Emperor's will, Angron and his ragged warband defied armies of trained, armed soldiers on his homeworld. They tasted freedom beneath clean skies and raised the cities of their enslavers. Now he leads an army of fattened by centuries of easy slaughter, and they cheer him the way his masters once cheered when he butchered beasts for their entertainment. That's not freedom. He knows that. He knows it well. This is not freedom, he thinks as he stares at the world eaters screaming his name. But the fight is only just beginning. When the Emperor dies under his axes, when his final thought is of how the Great Crusade was all in pathetic futility, and when his last sight is Angron's iron smile, then the master of mankind will learn what Angron has known since he picked up his first blade. Freedom is the only thing worth fighting for. It is why tyrants always fall. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope to read more stories. Hopefully every day I will be uploading a video during these fun times. Until next time, bye!